start off looking at some of the factors that go into neural integration. And just to we summarize or we define what neural integration is, it's all of the things that are happening on the soma of the neuron, summation, frequency coding, which we're gonna speak about here in a bit, um, convergence, divergence, all of those factors influencing the signals coming into the soma, all of that being analyzed at the axon hillock and then determining whether or not we meet threshold and to what degree do we depolarize that neuron. Um, and if that meets the, the, um, the requirement that's needed that negative 55 in order to then fire an action potential. Okay, and so we talked a little bit about divergence, convergence, right? The splitting of the signal versus the convergence of the signals that are coming in from different neurons. We also spoke about summation, which is really a review, um, temporal split summation and spatial summation. And then the third thing we wanna look at is called frequency coding. And this is something I've kind of been alluding to as we've gone you know, through the action potential but really understanding that action potentials are all or nothing. They are all identical. So they are always the same amplitude, right? Never larger, never longer. They are always the same duration. And so the way that we can determine different types of signals is by manipulating how quickly we fire those action potentials. In other words, the frequency of those action potentials, and that is called frequency coding. So we can code for a really strong stimulus. The way that the nervous system picks up a loud sound is by firing many action potentials, right? Increasing the frequency. The way that my muscles can understand that I'm lifting something heavy is by increasing the frequency of action potentials. And the opposite is true. The way that I can appreciate, um, my, my nervous system can appreciate a quiet sound or a low frequency sound is by decreasing how many action potentials are fired. And likewise, the way that my muscles appreciate a, a light load is by decreasing or, um, you know, um, de yeah, decreasing the frequency with which action potentials are fired. So this is how the nervous system codes different types of signals by manipulating the frequency of sending action potentials. Um, and so if we think about summation, summation affects the depolarization um, and we said that we can add different stimuli if they're coming in close enough in time or close enough in space on the soma. And so summation therefore influences frequency coding because if I'm receiving multiple stimuli that are coming in on the soma of the neuron, then I can add those together and they may likely get me to threshold more frequently, okay? So if I got a lot of stimuli coming in from many different neurons and I'm able to add them together to sum those, um, then I can depolarize my neuron more easily, more quickly, and so I can fire action potentials more frequently. So summation also influ uh, influences our ability to frequency code, to increase the frequency of action potentials. And the way that that is transmitted is that more action potentials ripping down the length of our axon, right? Just remember the, um, the structure here, um, sending more of a signal to the axon terminal to dump or release more neurotransmitter. And if more neurotransmitter is released at the synapse, then that is the likely um, that is that is going to likely lead to a greater IPSP or EPSP, depending on the types of channels that that neurotransmitter is going to open up or close. Okay, and again, thinking about those ligand gated channels and what would happen if we open or close those channels, depending on the response to that neurotransmitter. All right. Um, and so that was frequency coding, and then the fourth way that we can or the fourth factor that plays a role in neural integration is presynaptic modulation. And this brings us to speak about that type of synapse that we introduced, the axoaxonic synapse. And this is where we had the axon terminal of one neuron coming into contact or synapsing on to the axon terminal of another neuron. And that type of relationship, that type of connection or communication is what is, is involved in presynaptic modulation. So basically we have two types of influence. We can have presynaptic facilitation or presynaptic inhibition, 
but they are being modulated by the modulating neuron, which is synapsing on to the axon terminal of the presynaptic neuron at the synapse. So my modulating neuron is going to dump, not dump, excuse me, it's going to influence how much neurotransmitter is dumped by the presynaptic neuron into this synapse, so into this junction, and by extension, it's going to influence whether or not this neuron receives a, a, the signal, receives a stronger signal or a weaker signal, and by extension, whether or not we get to threshold on this postsynaptic neuron. Now, it's really important to understand that the modulating neuron does not immediately contribute to a membrane potential change. All it does is it influences the neuron that it's modulating, which is the presynaptic neuron, and by extension, influences how much neurotransmitter is dumped into this cleft. Alrighty. Okay. And so to kind of make more sense of that here, we've got two different scenarios. On the left, we're looking at presynaptic facilitation. Uh, can you go back to the previous slide quickly? Yep, sure. Thank you. Just let me know when you're done. And let me know if I'm going too fast. So that's really good feedback. Uh, I just need to quickly sketch the image. Oh, sure, sure. Okay, so while we're kind of finishing up here, I, I just want to continue to reiterate that the modulating neuron is not leading to a membrane potential change. It's not going to influence um, the, it's not going to create an action potential directly. It's not going to influence the uh, depolarization or hyperpolarization. It's only going to uh, sort of encourage or disencourage, whether it's facilitation or inhibition, just modulating that presynaptic neuron and specifically how much neurotransmitter is being dumped into that cleft. All right. All right, thank you. Okay, great. Um, yep, so just kind of highlighting that here, we've got presynaptic facilitation on the left and then we're looking at presynaptic inhibition here on the right. And we're thinking about at the top what's happening physically. So we've got our, um, postsynaptic neuron, which is neuron X in yellow. We've got our presynaptic neurons. So we've got neuron D, which is a presynaptic neuron. Neuron C is a presynaptic neuron. But then neuron E is a modulating neuron. Okay, it's this axoaxonic relationship that we described. And so the addition of neuron E modulating neuron C simply allows neuron C to dump more of its neurotransmitter into the cleft, and then that can influence how the, um, the action potential or the signal rather is transmitted onto neuron X, but neuron E does not directly uh, synapse or encourage neuron X to, um, to release or to fire an action potential, okay? It's just neuron E modulating neuron C to dump more transmitter, more neurotransmitter. Um, and so if we think about this down here on our graph, we're looking at the membrane potential change on the left. We're looking at the time here on the X. Um, and then we're thinking about what happens when neuron C um, is influencing the synapse. So at the synapse C, we see that there's a depolarizing event. It's not strong enough to get to threshold, but it does fire a depolarizing event there. Um, neuron D does the same thing. If we think about neuron E, it's flatlined, right? It doesn't influence the membrane potential change. It doesn't directly synapse onto neuron X. And so there's no membrane potential change if we think about neuron E on its own. If we think about neuron C and neuron E, Okay, so this connection, like this influence, this allows neuron C to dump more neurotransmitter. So if we thought about it on its own, it didn't give us a strong enough stimulus to get to threshold, but now that it is being modulated or you know, facilitating more neurotransmitter being released, it does give us enough of a stimulus to depolarize neuron X to threshold, okay? If we think about neuron D and E, Again, there's no influence because neuron E is not modulating neuron D. It's very specific or very selective in which neuron it is modulating. 
And contrasting that to presynaptic inhibition, you have the same type of relationship where the modulating neuron, in this case, neuron H, modulating neuron F is going to inhibit or decrease the amount of neurotransmitter that is re being released from this neuron and have a similar type of influence on the ability to depolarize neuron Y, all right? So again, looking down here at our graph, the depolarizing event of neuron F on its own is not enough to generate a threshold stimulus. Of neuron G on its own, again, not enough to give us a threshold stimulus. If we think about neuron H on its own, it's absolutely no membrane potential change because neuron H is not immediately synapsing onto neuron Y. If we think about neuron F and H, this is going to flatline. So we're going to cancel out the initial depolarization that we would see if it was neuron F alone. But because of this modulating relationship that neuron H is decreasing how much neurotransmitter is being dumped by neuron F, we now see that that is being canceled out. And if we think about the influence of neuron F, F and H, excuse me, then that is completely negated and it's flatlined. If we look at the influence of neuron F and G, so synapsing of F alone and G alone, then we would get to threshold because neuron F is a small greater potential, neuron G alone is a small greater potential, and so those together would be a threshold stimulus. But if we thought about neuron F, G, and H, then we're then again thinking about neuron F canceling, excuse me, neuron H canceling out the uh, depolarizing event of neuron F because it's decreasing the amount of neurotransmitter. And so that would only be the influence of neuron G alone, okay, which is not a threshold stimulus. All right, um, I'll pause here and see what questions we've got on that bit. So on this bit here, and then we'll keep going here. Okay. Now just comparing the different relationships um, between different types of synapses and how they behave in general. If we think about axo-axonic synapses, they can excite or inhibit one specific synapse. So they are only influencing the synapse at which the modulating neuron is influencing. So let me say that in another way. Um, if we think about this relationship, neuron H is only influencing the synapse of neuron F to neuron Y. It is not influencing any other synapse that's happening on neuron Y. So they're very selective in terms of which synapse they are modulating, but they can excite, which is facilitation, or inhibit, which is inhibition, that specific synapse. Um, comparing that to axodendritic and axosomatic types of synapses, which we said were much more common, much more prevalent, um, they can excite or inhibit, and then they are not selective. So if we're thinking about these types of synapses, they are going to influence, all of them are going to influence the uh, soma or the cell body that they are all synapsing on. And it's not going to be that selective relationship where we're only thinking about one synapse, but because we spoke about this idea of convergence, all of the signals that are coming, on, coming in onto that soma or onto those dendrites are going to be perceived, and it's not that selective type of relationship that we see with exo-exonic synapses. All right, um, and then the final slide here is just putting all of that together, thinking about um, looking at a holistic view of everything we've spoken about, not just in this unit, but in our previous unit, as we talked about the action potential, the membrane potential, and just really summarizing all of that in one um, illustration here. So we're thinking about a presynaptic neuron communicating to a postsynaptic neuron. We're also thinking about the different structures that are involved. So the dendrites, which are picking up signals, the soma or the cell body, right, the central part of this neuron. We're thinking about the axon and then we're thinking about the axon terminal. And then really adding the layers or the functional aspects of those different structures. So the action potential, which is being um, conducted by our axons on our presynaptic neuron will then encourage the opening up of voltage gated channels on the axon terminal of these presynaptic neurons. That is going to then cause 
the release of neurotransmitter. If, for instance, it is an excitatory neurotransmitter, that is going to cross the synaptic cleft, right? We're now thinking about our postsynaptic neuron. And the channels that are found on the soma or the cell body or the dendrites even of this postsynaptic neuron are going to be ligand gated channels. So that neurotransmitter that was released is going to specifically engage and bind onto these ligand gated channels and encourage them to open or to close. Um, and then based upon that activity, we're then going to see the movement of some type of ion or the non-movement of some type of ion. We said that if we had movement of sodium and calcium inward diffusing, that would be an EPSP, so an excitatory type of graded potential. If we had no movement, so if we closed those types of channels, that would be an IPSP. On the other hand, if we had out, um, excuse me, outward movement of um, potassium or inward movement of chloride, that would in itself be an IPSP. But if we close those two types of channels, that would constitute the opposite type of weighted potential or an EPSP, okay? So we really wanna be thinking about not just the opening and closing, but what channel we're opening and closing and what direction of what type of ion is being influenced, all right? Um, let's say, for example, sake, we're thinking about opening up a sodium channel that would cause inward movement of sodium. That would be an EPSP. That would cause um, the conduction of our uh, depolarizing event such that the axon hillock would be depolarized to threshold. And that would constitute the firing of another action potential as we open up those sodium um, those voltage-gated sodium channels, followed by the opening up of those potassium channels, right? Those voltage-gated potassium channels, which are the events that are required for an action potential. And then that would send another signal down our postsynaptic neuron as well, okay? And this, is, this has been really a simplistic way of explaining all of this. We've talked about the presynaptic neuron, the postsynaptic neuron, really from the perspective of one single synapse. But in actuality, if we think about the holistic view of the central and peripheral nervous system, each synapse is, um, is related to a presynaptic neuron and a postsynaptic neuron. But then the postsynaptic neuron, from the perspective of an adjacent synapse, now becomes the presynaptic neuron. Okay, I'll say that again. We're thinking about this neuron as being a postsynaptic neuron from the perspective of this synapse here. But if we were to look at the perspective of the adjacent, right, or the subsequent synapse, then this neuron now becomes our presynaptic neuron. And that really just shows us that the nervous system is one big continuous network of communication between several different neurons, many, many, many neurons that are synapsing in different directions, right? So converging and diverging. And so while we think about a single presynaptic neuron and a single postsynaptic neuron, at, you know, in terms of the perspective of a single synapse, we want to understand the broader picture, right? The, the more holistic view that it's really one large continuous network of signals being sent and received um, through brain and spinal cord. 